Good morning, good morning. Sorry about all the background noise. I've got the blower on full tilt. I'm waiting for the windscreen to defrost. Which is not going to happen anytime soon. There we go. So, how are you? Oh, this video is going to look a bit different from the ones that uh, I uh, just uploaded, based in April, saying how lovely and uh, sunny the whole uh, place was. Anyway, it's a, it's a Monday. It's about minus two, so enough to freeze the car over, but uh, not too bad. I can see through the windscreen enough to drive, so don't worry. It's just that little bit at the top in front of the camera that's uh, frozen. So, I hope you're doing well. I hope you've recovered from Christmas. If you're an alcoholic, then you'll be in uh, dry January or whatever they call it, to uh, give themselves the excuse to be an alcoholic for the other 11 months of the year. Not old Watty. Watty, since I found out I've got a less a subpar liver, I've uh, really not been doing all the drinking thing. There we are, I'll turn that down a bit now. Uh, uh, still got the remnants of my cold. <laughs> <coughs> there you go, just to prove it. So um, yeah, so what's up, what's up? Well go on. I've got uh, there's been a there's been a shift in the firmament in the fundamentum. The uh, Sunday it used to be a day there were never any politics done on the Sunday. And then but both the politicians and the media realised that uh, Sunday was the day that everybody sat in bed and read the newspaper from cover to cover. So, and also, uh, you know, had time to turn on the television and watch a sort of an early morning and mid-morning politics program. This place always floods. I don't know what, I, uh, I've gone over it, I'm not going to get diverted today. Why? Because it's my last day, I'm going on holiday for two weeks, starting tomorrow. So I'm going to uh, the Gambia, which is the Gambia and not Gambia, in the same way as the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom and not just United Kingdom. So uh, I've got quite a lot to do today. I've got to obviously finish off all the patients who need finishing off. I've got to. Uh, sort out my bank account so that I don't get any bills coming out of it that I can't, you know, won't, can't be paid. Well, I suppose I can technically, I can transfer money while I'm abroad. In fact, now <clears throat> I've got my banking apps on my phone. Um, actually, should be pretty, pretty simple. But um, my biggest problem is uh, if I either lose or or my phone gets stolen. Um, so I'm going to have to take a backup phone. <clears throat> God knows what would happen if my phone got if my phone got lost. That would be somewhat of a problem. Let's just put the windscreen, the mirrors up. So on Sunday, uh, politicians and the media realised that there was a massive news gap they could fill with politics and so now we tend to do a bit of politics in the morning while people are watching Sky News when to go to work and then uh, by the bulk of the politics gets done on the weekend. Now 
what that's meant is that there, there are some flagship political programs on Sunday where they get the big hitters like the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister and that. Um, the BBC's one used to be Andrew Marr, but it's now uh, been handed over to some other blonde presenter. It's got no 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 political cojones, you know. She's no no history of. Uh, she's not an Andrew Neil or anything. She's just a presenter, uh, and that <clears throat> sort of fits in with the BBC's uh, ethos, which is to. Uh, work with the government to let the government get its viewpoint across pretty much unobstructed um, which of course was and, and, and still is I think the uh, view, you know the objective of the BBC was set up to be the broadcasting arm of the government it wasn't set up to be independent or anything it makes a claim to be independent in the same way as the review body on doctors and dentists pay makes a claim to be independent but uh, doesn't mean it is independent, it just means that that's what it claims. So, and uh, to give you an idea, you know, and uh, having appeared on the BBC many times, my constant gripe with them was that they would, um, they would ask you on, they would interview you, they would uh, ask you what your point was, and then right at the end they would turn and sort of say, uh, well, this is a load of rubbish, and other people have said the exact opposite. And then they would bring on the minister, who would then say, yes, uh, you know, Mr. Watson's completely wrong, and blah, blah, blah. And spat a load of lies and misinformation, and then you, which you then couldn't get back on afterwards to um, debunk. <coughs> and almost always they, uh, you know, you'd say to them, well, I can come to the studio, and they'd say, no, that's all right, we'll do it over the phone. Whereas the uh, minister, they used to send a radio car, or used to, or now they have a permanent studio in Westminster, um, or they used to come into the BBC to do it and um, because they had a ministerial car that would take them there and so you would come across as some crazed uh, phone, phone in caller and they would come across as having the full weight and authority of the BBC by virtue of you know, being allowed to use the same studio facilities and stuff like that so it's a you know it's sort of subtle in a way but in other ways it's not subtle and uh, it's noticeable if you if you notice it, but not at all if you don't, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, Andrew Marr then, on, on the BBC, you know, uh, very sort of anodyne and uh, designed, as I say, entirely to not really put the government under any pressure or make them feel uncomfortable at all, because if they do, uh, and this uh, Piers Morgan found this out on the ITV, breakfast uh, show that if you do make them feel uncomfortable then they just won't come on and that's how they control the media message you know that's how they controlled it with the GDPA uh, the uh, Department of Health would would always talk to the BDA they would always talk to dentistry magazine that were always very pro the government line and pro the BDA but they wouldn't talk to the GDPA because we were the, the military wing of the BDA and we were we didn't agree with what they were doing. So that's just I'll have to crank that up a bit, sorry, because uh, we are fogging up very slightly. So what you do, you know, you're given a choice as a broadcaster, you either um, give them a, a soft ride or you don't get anybody up from the government to comment, which makes your show look pretty Pathetic, and as though you're commenting on a, at a second tier level, you know, you're just commenting on the comment at that point, and which is not really good, is it, for a, something that's trying to be a, a first tier reporter? So, um, and then uh, on uh, Sky, they've got uh, Trevor Phillips, who is. Uh, again, he's like he's he's more. I would say he's more a mouthpiece of uh, Sky uh, News Corp. Um, in that he tends to uh, put forward their their narrative, their agenda, and uh, but not not really, you know, hone in on the actual issues if the issues are not News Corp's 
issues and, and not on their agenda. So, um, so and he's not very. Uh, uh, how can I put it? He's not. Again, he doesn't have uh, Peter Jay's or Robin Day's incisive uh, abilities to cut through the crap and get a decent answer. Uh, or, or Andrew Neil, even he's just uh, you know he's the way he deals with things is he says look if the minister doesn't answer his question you say look minister you know you're not answering my question so he asks it again and if the minister then doesn't answer his question again he says well so you're still not answering my question and if the third time he doesn't answer it he says oh well all right then no you're, you're obviously not going to answer that so well let's move on you know and the uh, viewers are sort of left uh, thinking well what was the point of that you know what is the point of, of asking the bloke you know can you not phrase it in a different way can you not point out to him him the uh, you know the essential uh, uh, tension within his argument the two perhaps two halves of the argument don't agree with each other or the hypocrisy in the uh, stance that's being taken etc etc <coughs> anyway cut a long story short then uh, if you want to uh, you know if you want to see the big hitters and sort of and just have a weekly update on politics then Sunday morning's your best bet and that's made it uh, the best place to announce uh, various um, policies so for example if you wanted to uh, announce a change of narrative then the best way to get it across to people is on a Sunday morning because these shows have re relatively large viewerships. So, imagine my surprise when on Sunday, both on Sky News, Trevor Phillips, and then uh, later on the BBC, government spokespeople came on to say that they now considered it was uh, an individual's responsibility as to whether or not they got vaccinated and not uh, part of an individual's collective responsibility to society as a whole and to the NHS, to our feeble NHS. And uh... right, let's just let's just nip around him. So, and this totally contradicts the narrative for the last two years, since March 2020, uh, where the narrative has been that um, it's your, you're obliged to get vaccinated, even though you disagree with compulsory medical treatment, um, because you <clears throat> are a ticking time bomb as an unvaccinated person, and you are uh, likely to be a vector for the spread of the disease and you are likely to be going around coughing everywhere and, and killing everybody's granny and therefore as a result uh, you are a non-person and should uh, lose your um, employment, you know, your right to earn a living um, and do what I don't know, presumably go on the dole or something or find a job where uh, you're not patient facing or public facing work, work uh, I don't know, you couldn't even work down a coal mine could you, I mean they're in close proximity to each other so <clears throat> so now um, you know, so now it's like uh, well, you know, and they've taken this gang up to and including threatening to sack everybody who's not vaccinated uh, and in America, they've done, you know, every uh, company with more than 100 employees that has in any way any interaction with a federal uh, contractor. Uh, so let's say 99% of your work is in the public sector, uh, private sector, and then <coughs> but you have an occasional contract, let's say, to uh, say you're a printer, and you're mostly printing restaurant menus, and uh, and then all of a sudden... Uh, a government, you get a government job to print some menus for a government dinner or something, uh, then they're going to be um, asking to see the vaccination status of your employees. 
because you then become a federal subcontractor and and as a federal subcontractor with over 100 employees you you have to have sacked everybody who wasn't vaccinated even if they've had covid even if they've had several versions of covid so <clears throat> So they push it up about as far as they can push, you know. I mean, they threaten people with the loss of their jobs. They set a deadline of early January, or I think it was originally December in America. They then set another deadline and said that they were gonna, you know, this is the, they're gonna extend the deadline, but this is the final extension of the deadline, etc., etc., etc. And, um, <clears throat> and then uh, said that, you know, you need to inform on your neighbor if he's not vaccinated. Um, etc and then they, they've done absolutely everything they can and so they've got to the point where now um, uh, vaccination protests in, in countries are increasing although they're never ever uh, reflected on the mainstream news you never ever hear that you know there's been a massive protest in Amsterdam or Berlin or wherever um, and uh, They, they pretty well said, oh, you know, well, okay, all right then, you know, from now on, don't worry, uh, what we did was entirely appropriate because the situation was a lot worse now, but now it's a lot better and now we're going to say, well, if you decide not to get yourself vaccinated, that's your own fault, you know, and this is including, including uh, uh, blaming people who are in uh, intensive care on, bre on respirators and saying that the vast majority of them were unvaccinated and then um, you know implying that uh, these people are wasting money by being sick uh, or because of their uh, convictions or, or their failure to uh, submit to the medical totalitarianism now I'm going to say at this point I am not an anti-vaxxer, okay? So now you might think, well, well what are you angry? You're sounding a bit like an anti-vaxxer. But in fact, I'm not. I've had both vaccines. I've had uh, the booster. I do think that uh, if you're certainly my age, over 60, you should, you know, and it's the over 60s that bear the brunt of this, um, you should get a vaccine, unless, uh, you know, especially if you're immunocompromised. So, so by no means am I an anti-vaxxer. And I encourage people to... Um, be vaccinated and I know it's worrying I mean if, if let's say there's a one in a million chance that something might go wrong then that is worrying isn't it you know you think to yourself well okay it's all very well it's only one in a million before you have it done isn't it, it and then if it's uh, you know if you have it done and then nothing happens then the chances are zero and if you have it done and, the, and then something does happen then the chances are a hundred percent so it sort of crystallised, but like Schrodinger's cat. It sort of only gets crystallised once once you look at the result. But <clears throat> I encourage people to, um, uh, you know, to not to be scared of the vaccine. And I myself had many vaccines. You know, I mean, I've had everything from BCG to polio, uh, yellow fever. Um, obviously hepatitis which all dentists do do have but the point I'm trying to make is that there, they, there's been a sea shift in um, this the principle which is the principle was that you should be vaccinated because it helps keep everybody else safe in the same way as I would like to say to everybody on the roads here they shouldn't be on the roads because it'd be a lot safer for me driving if they weren't on the roads now that's clearly a stupid principle and, um, and, and not supportable, but it was supported for two years. And now it's become apparent that even if you are vaccinated, the whole purpose of the vaccination is to prevent illness and death. And, and it's not to prevent um, cross-contamination, to prevent transmission. Because you can, uh, you can um, give someone, uh, you can catch and give someone the virus even if you've been vaccinated and I know this for a fact because I've got a members of my family family of four where the mother um, 
worked in a public facing job, contracted it, uh, have, despite being double jabbed, uh, has been uh, ill, but not seriously ill, has um, passed it on to the infant child of one who's, who is now ill, but not seriously ill. Um, and then the uh, second child of four got it, who's now ill, uh, but hopefully not seriously ill. And now all that's left is for the father to um, uh, to catch it. And he's again, he's double vaccinated, but that's not going to stop him catching it. And the fact that the mother was double vaccinated didn't stop her giving it to everybody. So I'm um, pleased that, um, you know, you could call it market forces if you like. But I think my mother would just say common sense has prevailed and that the idea of uh, people need to get vaccinated based on their personal risk profile and, um, and shouldn't be persecuted for um, making a decision one way or the other. Right, there we go. So that's my final, uh, that's my final um, sermon for today before I go on holiday. So when I come back I should look very rested very browned and hopefully should have shifted a couple of pounds. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye.